Welcome everyone, we are happy to have you here today. Uh, there is a beautiful and important field that is opening up which is called probabilistic programming. We are fortunate to have uh, Sharon here with us who has been in uh, high, who has brought high levels of expertise and a part of the original development in this field. So uh, he's going to do this talk for us. Yeah. Uh... Thank you for the kind introduction. So yeah, so today we'll be kind of going over the general topic of probabilistic programming, uh, why it was uh, kind of motivated uh, at the beginning on why it needs to be there, uh, the entire research field. And then we'll go over uh, various aspects of it, uh, like, uh, various aspects of it in, in the sense it's go going to be mainly about inference uh, after which we'll go over implementation aspects within Julia then we also will kind of transition to Gaussian processes which is a closely related field and often kind of used with probabilistic programming and uh, it's a, a closely related set of models which are often of common interest and uh, uh, I was kind of privileged to be part of both those development teams uh, before. So to start off, uh, let me just give you a short, I mean, this is too much of an introduction, but uh, the short introduction of myself is that I work as a research scientist for Julia Hub, which was previously called Julia Computing, if you're more familiar with that name. And what we are working on is Julia Sim. It's essentially a cloud-based scientific computing platform. So, uh, and, uh, it's based on the Julia language, obviously. And uh, what we aim to do there is essentially take any sort of a dynamic system. So uh, when I say dynamic system, it's usually differential equations, uh, which you come across in a variety of fields, all the way from pharmacology to uh, uh, engineering to all sort of places, right? And uh, they are very prevalent. And we try to create machine learning surrogates of them or machine learning replacements of those uh, dynamic systems because they are very, very expensive to compute or solve, right? So prior to this, a lot, most of my work was uh, related to prob probabilistic programming or Gaussian processes. So uh, before this, I was uh, working with gen.jl, uh, which is a probabilistic language within Julia developed out of uh, MIT's probabilistic computing lab and where I was essentially working on sort of methods to validate. So I'll come to it, I'll, I'll give a brief, uh, if you are interested, I can give a brief explanation of what I did there at the end, uh, so that you will have the background of probabilistic programming before I get into the research side of things. And I, I was a long time collaborator of the machine learning group of uh, University of Cambridge. So that's where I got into Turing.jl which is going to be a central topic of discussion today, as well as um, Gaussian processes, Julia Gaussian processes. So that's an entire ecosystem uh, of Gaussian process, specific to Gaussian processes, built using all the Julia capabilities in mind. So it is not going to be like a replacement for something like an R package or something else, a MATLAB package. Uh, so it is going to use true essence of Julia to get things going, right? And uh, yeah, uh, I also spent a summer in India, uh, France, which is basically working on Bayesian neural nets, which is related to pro probabilistic programming languages because we often implement these Bayesian neural nets within these probabilistic program uh, programming languages, but it's sort of an application. Uh, it's not like application in the sense like economics or something. But obviously it's a, uh, since probabilistic program is such a broad field, uh, it has uses even in like deep learning sort of a regime as well, right? So today, uh, like before we start off, I want to get a kind of brief sense of understanding of where we stand as a group here. So how many of you know what a probabilistic programming language is or in general, are you aware of ever writing code to uh, describe a probabilistic program? Uh, anyone? 
one. Okay, so that's good. <laughs> so uh, it's good in the sense that uh, we, uh, my talk is going to be much more introductory and uh, uh, it should motivate its use, right? And I think the second question is moot uh, if the first question uh, is a no, right? Uh, second question is, well, oh, that's great. That's, uh, yeah. Oh, I don't have that one on. Good, good catch. Uh, Edward, TensorFlow probability, uh, they were also, uh, that is also one of the uh, probabilistic programming languages. In fact, PyMC4 was attempted to be built based on it. And actually my GSOC project with PyMC4 was exactly that, to uh, replace their, uh, I think it was some other backend with TensorFlow probability backend. But uh, yeah, uh, so it did happen eventually. But uh, so PyMC4 is actually based on TensorFlow probability. Uh, and okay, so we will kind of uh, briefly talk about some of these later on. But for now, uh, our main focus is still going to be Turing, just because uh, I am <laughs> more familiar with it and there's more interest with an XKDR for Turing also. So I think uh, uh, these are mentioned in the order of my familiarity with them. So <laughs> Turing first, then Gen, then Stan. Stan is like kind of a very widely used probabilistic programming language, uh, which has sort of a C backend, uh, and it is very powerful in the sense that uh, from a performance perspective, it is optimized. So every time anyone tries to uh, like benchmarks anything within probabilistic programming regime, it's usually against Stan. Why? Because it's widely used and it's the standard among statisticians uh, who, who uh, work in probabilistic programming. So, um, yeah, uh, we get to that. So, to start off with the motivation of this whole, I keep saying probabilistic, uh, every like five seconds. So why probabilistic, right? Uh, and why not, uh, the, the kind of counterpart for all of this is deep learning, which I'm sure everyone is sort of familiar with in some broad sense. Uh, so what, let's first kind of cover what happens in deep learning. In deep learning, we care about deterministic models and the, the kind of whole, um, kind of assumption in deep learning is that determinic, uh, deterministic models are sufficient to kind of represent any sort of uh, uh, system, right? So at the end of the day, when you try to predict using a deep learning model, you will get a single value or like a real value or a real uh, array of uh, real values, something uh, deterministic. And it's filled with deterministic computations and it's usually matrix operations. Uh, in the sense that uh, it's huge matrix operations which uh, use tons of GPUs and all of that. And it's good because it's very scalable uh, using a GPU. Uh, and it's, uh, it, has, it has more scope for uh, reproducibility and so on also. What is the main goal in deep learning? It's to minimize loss. Right? There is some sort of a loss function defined uh, usually with respect to a data, a data set. So you're trying to minimize some sort of a loss function. And uh, this loss function uh, is optimized using some sort of an optimization scheme. It could be something uh, as crazy as Adam or something as simple as uh, like very basic gradient descent. So uh, it doesn't matter what the actual optimization scheme is. Uh, like we are trying to uh, solve or kind of navigate ourselves through this lost terrain. If you kind of visualize it as a sort of like a hilly region or something, you're trying to find the valley in there, right? Somehow. Uh, like if we contrast this to Bayesian or probabilistic machine learning, uh, it is that we don't, uh, we have a worldview that everything is a product of random variables, that every process, so a flip of a coin is a very classic example. It's essentially a random variable, 
right? It's a Bernoulli random variable and we represent even parameters of these different distribution, say Bernoulli using other uh, uh, random variables. And in case of a, a flip of a coin, it's usually beta distribution, which kind of uh, describes the probability, uh, prior over probability. We'll get to all of that. So what do we try to do here is that we probabilistically compute. So we are dealing with random variables, not one single value. We are dealing with distributions and not just data, right? Uh, there is data, there is deterministic data which we uh, uh, use, but we start off with a distribution. We don't start off with a random deterministic function, right? And uh, uh, the end goal here is not to optimize any loss as such, although, uh, yeah, uh, for now, uh, let's assume that it's not to optimize any loss, it's to find a distribution, that is, find a distribution uh, like an updated distribution given the data we see, right? So there is a distribution at first, which is usually called the prior, right? And then we see a bunch of data and we update it um, to a posterior, right? A posterior is an updated distribution. Think of it as a learned model. It's uh, the analog is the learned model. So in case of deep learning, optimization was crucial because navigating the loss function was everything. Uh, but in case of Bayesian or probabilistic ML, inference is crucial. So this probabilistic inference, this is essentially the finding of the posterior distribution or kind of somehow approximating it, uh, whatever, uh, like, or trying to find it in an exact way. Some cases even that is possible. Uh, computing the posterior in a very exact manner. So all of that um, means inference. And that is the most crucial part with Bayesian ML. So yeah, so with all this, the summary is that we think we need to keep track of uncertainty. Uncertainty is crucial in the Bayesian regime because uncertainty can creep in and stuff like, you know, fat tail distributions can creep in and totally mess up your end product. Uh, and the goal here is to have uh, not just model definition, uh, model definition is important, but even inference, that is finding the updated uh, distribution, uh, it's keeping track of all these various uh, like abnormality, abnormalities in the distribution. So however complex it is, the goal with the inference is it should be able to get the exact posterior and uh, exact posterior will always come with an uncertainty measure and we are happy with the uncertainty measure. Uh, with deep learning, uh, often it's discarded. It's like this is what you get, uh, a deterministic value. You take it like there is no, there's often uh, uh, no uh, indicator of how sure is the model about a given prediction. Nowadays, there is a bunch of improvements there, like uh, explainable uh, deep learning and all of that, but it's still not there yet. It, it is still kind of uh, like just predicting something random uh, and you have no clue on why it got there, first thing. And uh, the second thing is how sure the model is about that. So let's kind of see an example uh, probabilistic model. Uh, it's about being able to kind of successfully uh, hit a go uh, like a golf ball, right? So a short golf a shot, how successful can you be at hitting that? So there's, we, in this model, we design uh, the source of data, right? We kind of uh, think about how the data could have been formed. And that's how we go about building a probabilistic model. It's never about, let's put something black boxed and figure it out. It's always about, let's think about how the data might have been formed and literally design that causal sort of graph. And then later on, uh, if you look at here, uh, you kind of denote a distribution to each of those random variables. So this way, uh, you are sure about the assumptions you make, 
right? Yeah, it is concrete about the assumptions you make, and uh, you might not know all these values. It's not that you'll know what the variance of a shot is or the variance of a distance of a golf shot is, but it's about uh, like accepting that there is a variance and uh, accepting that there is some amount of randomness there, and putting that into a concrete model, right? Uh, so in this case, it's a half normal, uh, essentially like a truncated normal, uh, which is the variance of the uh, uh, distance. It's basically the only the positive side of a normal distribution. And same with the shot, right? Uh, and using this, you kind of compute the probability uh, of a good angle or a good distance, right? What is the right angle and the right distance to get the shot in, right? So uh, using these variables, we compute uh, these probabilities deterministically. And there's also dispersion in the sense that there could be some other outside event, say there's a wind, right? So we are trying to account for randomness in, in the world using some sort of a uh, external sort of a randomness uh, variable. So that way, if we do end up seeing some abnormalities in the data, it doesn't just accept it. it. It is able to say that, okay, this data is probably abnormal due to some wind or whatever, and kind of put that, in, uh, like, uh, kind of blame dispersion for that data, like having an option to blame dispersion for that data, right? Together, we have a probability of success, right? Uh, so the exact kind of mechanics of how you do it is obviously left to you. That's not important. What is important is that, uh, yeah, like when we are trying to understand how to build probabilistic models, it's about the relationships. So this variable relates to this variable uh, in which way, right? So we, you can iterate on what the exact function is, all of that is fine, but it's important to identify those different random variables first, and then you can iterate on the exact mechanics of the probabilistic model. So the central thing throughout probabilistic ML or Bayesian ML is the Bayes theorem. And without uh, understanding this, uh, it doesn't, inference doesn't make sense, uh, posterior doesn't make sense, nothing makes sense, right? So let us spend some time on this. So uh, how many of you are familiar with the Bayes theorem? Uh, okay, yeah, almost half of them are familiar, that's good. So. The basic idea behind Bayes, uh, Bayes' theorem is that you have a distribution, right, which is a prior, uh, and then you have some data, right. Uh, after seeing that data, uh, how will you update your distribution, right? So it could be something like um, you want to compute, uh, you want to fit the normal uh, distribution on a bunch of data. So when you want to fit a normal distribution, you have to, um, what do you call it, uh, two parameters. Uh, one is uh, the mean, the other one is the standard deviation, right? So the more data you see, you can keep updating your mean, right? So that is the general idea. It's a very online learning fashion in the sense that the more data you see, the more sure you will be. And if you look at the distribution, it will keep getting sharper. Uh, so as you see more data, we'll get to it. We'll, uh, we'll visualize a bunch of inference algorithms and kind of uh, discuss that in more detail. Uh, but the general idea is you see data, then you update your distribution. So often there's also this lower term called evidence, which is P of X, right? So the way we often obtain P of X, uh, let, let's go over the, actually let's go over the main ones first. Posterior, what is posterior? So what is the updated distribution given some data? That is the posterior, right? Prior, what is your initial belief about the given data, right? You make an initial assumption, so that is what PY is. P of X given Y is a very important term, which is what we call likelihood. So likelihood is how, uh, how likely is the data which you saw if a given parameter was true, right? So let's assume the mean is one. If mean is one, how likely is the given data which I see, right? So this can usually be uh, easily computed. Uh, this can uh, usually be easily computed. Why? Because 
uh, it is like part of every probabilistic distribution you see. So every time you see a normal or uh, any of that, uh, any other distribution, you usually come up with a PDF, right? A probability density function. So using that, uh, it's as simple as plugging in the data in the prob uh, probabilistic density function and checking the likelihood. So PDF literally gives you the likelihood if you plug in the data to it, right? So usually the denominator here, evidence, is ignored uh, in like application. Why? Because very computationally intensive to compute in the sense that the way you compute p of x is by integrating over y, integrating the numerator across y. That is, you take every possible uh, uh, parameter value and check, which you can never do, right? Like, can you check the normal distribution against every possible mean? No, it is just not possible. So uh, it's not tractable uh, often, uh, unless there's some sort of an exact approximation or whatever. So often the denominator is ignored and what we care about is just the numerator, how large the numerator is. The numerator uh, is called unnormalized posterior. So the, the denominator is basically normalizing the posterior. That is, uh, when you think about it from the basics of probability, it basically is maintaining the mass of the distribution and kind of maintaining that the area under the curve is one, right? You need area under the curve to be one. So P of X is the term which kind of forces it to be one. We, but in practice, we don't care whether it's uh, totals and integrates up to one or not. We only care about the relative measures, which is more likely with respect to what, right? That's how we decide between uh, a likely parameter and an unlikely parameter, just by comparing their numerators and not by computing the entire posterior uh, probability. So that's what, Bayes theorem is all about. It's about just updating your distribution given data, right? Uh, yeah. So now uh, let's go into a bit of code. So whenever we talk about probabilistic programming, we usually talk about a declarative programming. When I say declarative, I mean that you define the entire model at the start. You tell uh, you make it clear what your entire model is at the start, what are your variables, what are the priors, right? So in this case, if you look at the first one, you have a sigma square, this is a variance term. The variance term is following, uh, it's it's assumed to follow a uh, like half normal distribution, right? So that's an assumption, which we make clear at the start. So that's why it's declarative, you declare an assumption. So other way will be something like procedural programming or some, some sort of a script based programming where as you go along, you will define new, new stuff. But that is not possible with a model because you need to know the full information about the model beforehand. Otherwise, how will you know about what the prior is, what the likelihood is? We'll come to how we kind of map each of these to a prior or likelihood and all. And it will be more clear when I go to the code, but uh, yeah. So, so we, we do declarative programming in Julia using some sort of a, uh, uh, like a macro, uh, at model macro. Uh, there are different variations of it in different languages. But the general idea is that within this, you have to define your entire model. You could have sub models. I'm not saying that it has to be all in one like serial piece of code. You can always have sub models. Uh, but uh, it all has to be declared at, at the start. And this is usually done using a DSL. Uh, DSL is a domain specific language. And uh, domain specific language is like the, like the main application of it that we care about today is all of probabilistic programming. Usually there is some special language, right? For example, this follows uh, this operator uh, is not in regular Julia. It's not a regular Julia operator at all. It's something which we made up for probabilistic programming purposes because we are familiar with that notation that a given random variable follows a given distribution, right? So that is the domain specific language here. It's about making use of such easily readable. This, al this almost feels like a mathematical equation. It feels less of a code and more of a mathematical equation. Uh, that is thanks to Julia. 
But uh, if you saw the same thing in probably TensorFlow probability or one of those Python things, it will be some complicated looking thing where it will be like some TF dot uh, normal and <laughs> it will be some equal to sign and then you will have to instantiate the distribution, whatever it is, it's pretty complicated. So here it is, it is as good as pseudocode, right? Uh, that is the entire idea and Turing comes as close to pseudocode as possible, I guess, for probabilistic programming when compared to any other uh, language I've seen till now. Uh, Stan is a close second. Uh, Stan is also pretty good in that sense that uh, it is able to give very pseudocode looking stuff, but it has its own problems because it's in C and uh, a lot of stuff, we'll get to that. Uh, so if we quickly go through it, what we are doing is we are defining uh, random variables. What, what are the key parameters in a linear regression model? It's the intercept uh, and uh, the coefficients, right? So we give, uh, we assign a prior for each of them. And in this case, n features is basically number of inputs, right? So x, uh, so it, it is assumed to have two uh, features. Sorry, not two features. It can have any number of features. Uh, it just happen. Uh, it's assumed that uh, the second dimension of x will be the number of features and uh, the first dimension will be the number of inputs themselves, right? And um, yeah, so uh, this is the regular linear regression for formula which we are all familiar with, mu is equal to intercept plus uh, uh, x uh, star coefficient, right? Um, Sorry? How it is probably different from OLS and something like that? OLS is, like, oh, okay, uh, uh, like least squares. So I'll get to that. I'll get to how inference will help you kind of take uncertainty measures and all of that uh, in a bit. I'll also show it in code. So we are very clear about it. But we are, for now we are only discussing how model specification. And the good thing about model specification using a probabilistic programming language is that you can use the full flexibility of the language itself, right? Or whatever the language is, Julia, Python, whatever. So internally, like inside the ZAT model, you can do any crazy computation uh, which the language supports and it will still be support. It, sh it should still be supported as long as uh, it's uh, like, uh, there are very less barriers in Turing. You can do whatever you want because uh, I think uh, stuff like, uh, automatic differentiation or all of that kind of flows to any uh, variable in Julia. But in Python, it needs to be some TensorFlow, uh, like uh, a, a tensor or, or some sort of an object like that, so that it's actually trackable uh, by uh, the automatic differentiation system, which is a very crucial aspect for some of the inference algorithm, right? Sorry, one more question. Yeah. So what does lower limit mean? Yeah, here, sorry. Yeah, here what this essentially means is that you take a normal, then you truncate it. That is you take only the, uh, anything above zero. So it becomes the positive normal distribution or half normal distribution. So here uh, the lowest value this distribution can give is zero. The highest value will be uh, like not hundred, sorry, infinity. Uh, but this like think of it as a normal distribution, but one half cut off, that's it, nothing else. Um, Okay, so MV normal is nothing but multivariate normal. So we are defining multivariate normal using an array of means, an array of, uh, uh, so this is a covariance matrix. So I is basically identity matrix. So it's a 10 into identity matrix. So it's basically a multivariate normal distribution. 10, 10, 10 is like a standard deviation of sorts of the, like, uh, the regular like identity matrix will have one, right? So with when you multiply it by 10, it will be a 10 uh, matrix, 10 along the diagonal. That way, this is prior. yeah, that's my prior, that's, that's it. Your assumption. Yeah, yeah, that's an assumption, that's it. 10, yeah, you, uh, if you want, you could have defined a full matrix here, full uh, uh, n features by n features matrix over here, but uh, we just assume a simpler one. This, this is like a mean field uh, normal kind of a thing. Okay, uh, let me just pause for a second. Before, uh, like if you have any questions till now on uh, 
anything uh, about problem specification or about uh, Bayes theorem in general. I guess these are the two uh, main things which you have covered till now. Um, yeah. Yeah. So all the computation in your I just wanted to ask sir, will all the computation system be eliminated or is it still that in complex uh, computer system it gets affected by different computers? So uh, let's put it this way. So if you know the exact uh, kind of a uh, way to compute the evidence, which is possible in some cases. Uh, say I'll get to it like Gaussian processes. There are some exact Gaussian processes where there is a literally a formula to uh, get the posterior, right? There's a mathematical formula to get go from the prior to posterior given the data, right? In those cases, this evidence, all of that will be considered. But often we won't be doing exact inference. That is, we won't exactly find the posterior. We'll approximate the posterior because first uh, it might be intractable in the sense that there might not be a formula to compute the posterior. In that case, you have to approximate it, approximate the posterior. When you're approximating the posterior, you only care about the numerator usually. So uh, all this, uh, I'll get to the different sort of uh, inference schemes, but all they care about is comparison between two plausible parameter values. They don't care about the exact probabilities of that parameter being the correct one. They only care about uh, what are the probabilities, what are the comparison, which is more likely. Uh, like given this data, is uh, for a normal distribution, is the normal likely to be one or minus one, right? That is the kind of comparison any given, um, uh, any given inference scheme makes. So you compare and go towards the parameter which is more likely. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I'll move on. Um, the next thing is, okay, we define some uh, nice looking uh, uh, like model, right? Which is easy to look at, easy to understand and all of that. But how do we actually perform like posterior, uh, like given some data. So with linear regression, you have XY data. So if you have XY data, how do you go about uh, finding the posterior? Uh, this is usually a very hard task in the sense that uh, for linear regression, there might be some sort of an exact formula, but in general, uh, it is a very hard task because you can't find that formula that easily. You'll have to go sit and derive it like page for pages. Uh, that is one option. Uh, or the second option is to uh, do trial and error. That is, you try every uh, parameter possible and see uh, in which case the data fits well. So in which case the numerator is really nice, right? You kind of do trial and error. Both of them are not really uh, scalable, right? You can't automate all of that. So wh what we go about is we go about automatically generating inference code using some inference schemes, which I'll get to. So what those inference schemes are is essentially a systematically kind of guessing the parameter, right? It's not about random guesses, not about random manual guesses, where you randomly try a parameter, check the data, and see, oh, did the model, does the model conform to my data? That is a very uh, hard process to do. The other option is to do it mathematically, de deriving the inference code. Uh, just for something as simple as linear regression, it is probably like half a page of just mathematical equations, right? And you don't want to sit and do that. You And linear regression is very simple. It's like three variables and you can like try to do that at least. And people do it for whatever academic reasons. But as soon as you scale, say you have 100, 100 variables, right? Uh, 100 variables with 100 different uh, priors and uh, like all of that. So how do you go about finding a formula? Uh, it's not feasible. That's why we need inference code, automated inference code. And that is what probabilistic programming is all about. One aspect of probabilistic programming is definition. That is usually the easier problem. The easier problem is defining what you want. Right. The harder problem is to actually think of this model as a distribution, a prior distribution, and then have a like uh, out of the box method to update that distribution. That is the harder problem, which is why inference code comes into play. And yeah, the the reason inference code is hard is 
like even if you say derive, you sit and derive it for linear regression, even if you change, like if you add one more variable to it, say I, I add uh, after uh, like intercept coefficient, I also add an error term. Now my entire formula is null and void. I have to sit and derive it from scratch again, right? Uh, that is why you don't want to sit and manually derive any stuff, right? Because small changes to a code will completely destroy, uh, and a small changes to a model will completely invalidate the inference code. So, yeah. So uh, this is just to summarize. What the first two points was just summarizing what I said. DSL domain specific language is used to define the probabilistic model, and then you automate the inference code generation. Now, um, what the PPL is primarily responsible for is use the powerful representation a DSL gives you, right? With whatever the core, the core language or the core backend gives you. Like in case of Julia, it's the entire language itself because the entire language uh, has uh, like automatic differentiation and all the variables are basically tracked uh, in one sense by the by Turing or by the language itself. But in say Python, then you will probably be uh, dealing with some tensors like a PyTorch tensor or a, or a TensorFlow uh, or tensor, whatever it is. So use the full representation, right? And also along with it, give automated inference capabilities. So whatever you define, you should have a guarantee that I'll have some sort of inference scheme for that. And that is what a PPL provides. But uh, I have to warn you that this guarantee which you get is often misleading in the sense that that inference code might be valid, but it might only be valid in, in like limit, that is in infinity. If you run it for infinite amount of time, uh, uh, it might be valid. That's where some of my research uh, uh, comes into play. Uh, I'll get to that. So, uh, but in general, you at least have a guarantee that it will sort of work. Right? Uh, before you didn't even, uh, before probabilistic programming languages, you had no guarantees. You were just stuck with the model and nothing else. Um, so just by the way it's combining representational power of a language with the automatic inference capabilities, it's bringing in two different fields. One is the programming language folks, right? So uh, if you see a lot of like uh, PL um, conferences like Popel, and a bunch of conferences, they have a lot of probabilistic programming languages papers in them. Why? Because there is like a convergence of two different fields here because you need representation power. So for example, I would say Gen uh, JL, which is the uh, probabilistic programming language by M uh, like MIT's Pro probabilistic computing lab is much more better at representation than say Turing. Why? Because the whole focus there was representation, not easy inference. I, I would often sit and write uh, like uh, like 100 lines of inference code there because they were not focusing on making inference like one line. They were focusing on making, representing anything in the world. They had gone to an extent where they were representing like objects in a 3D domain. Like, you know, they started off with by sampling a 3D point, like three dimensional point. And from there, they used to sample which kind of shape it is, like uh, like a cuboid, uh, a cube, or a sphere, whatever it is. Then they would sample if it's a cube, uh, how what is the size of the cube? If it is sphere, uh, what is the radius of the sphere? So they had that much level of uh, uh, like you know uh, uh, representational capabilities. It was filled with PL people. The lab was filled with pro uh, programming languages folks because they cared about representation and they were inferring on things like uh, uh, what will happen if a light hits uh, the object in a certain way uh, uh, and like uh, e even stuff like uh, robot, uh, what do you call it, mapping, right? So they, they used to literally generate the entire scene, like make it representable in a probabilistic model. So even if the uh, even if the environment of the robot is uncertain and it's literally a distribution, right? It's able to navigate it because it's able to kind of accommodate the variances of the environment because the environment itself is represented as a distribution in a programming language. So that is the like the max I've seen of uh, um, uh, 
uh, like representational power. Then uh, on the other hand, there are people who don't care about that much representation. They're like, sure, sure. So sure. With uh, gender gel, yeah. I get very high representational power. Yeah. But then what does the engine do? What good is that engine? If all I'm doing is writing a cute model. No, yeah, so, but you will also get a lot of custom inference capabilities. So beyond a point, I'll, uh, any sort of off the shelf inference scheme will be useless. It might give you samples, but those samples will be highly correlated and they, you will have to basically throw them away. Like if you take the effective sample size of that uh, scheme by removing all the correlation and stuff, it will be like two or three, even if you take like thousand samples, right? So uh, that is why, uh, they realize that anyway we have to write our own inference code. But let us make our uh, like modeling infrastructure the best in the world basically. Yeah. Turing on the other hand they are they are like okay we will have medium sized models right. Not just linear regression say we have some complex uh, Gaussian processes related stuff right. Uh, which is all represented within Julia language right. But can we give a off, off the shelf uh, decent um, what do you call it uh, inference schemes that is what Turing cares about right and they also care about modularity I'll get to that uh, in the sense that uh, oftentimes uh, say Stan for example uh, they stuck to one uh, inference scheme and they're like whatever model you give we'll only keep using one inference scheme which is nuts HMC no U-turn sampler, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo inference, right? And that it's good in a way in that they care about modeling and they care about taking that one single inference scheme and making it better, making it the best in the world. But there are like theoretical limitations to that one given inference scheme. That one given inference scheme will not always work, right? So you uh, say uh, like that they're like proper the places where it will definitely fail, right? Like for example, in a funnel-like structure, uh, so if you have a funnel-like distribution, an infinite funnel-like distribution, uh, so in those kind of scenarios, you will see that uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which Stan uses, doesn't even get anywhere close to the actual posterior. It will just fail, right? But they're like, okay, it's a limitation and they move on. But uh, Turing is kind of in the midway in the sense that they're like, okay, we'll support medium level problems, but we'll support a bunch of inference schemes, right? Uh, and you can pick and choose, you can optimize, I, I don't know, uh, like modularize it. We'll get to how to modularize it and all of that. So, okay. Uh, yeah, so there are four main types of inference schemes which we care about. Uh, so first is the most, the I think the oldest and uh, like the theoretically the most grounded, uh, which is uh, MCMC, Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Uh, here you are essentially um, comparing between two different uh, points, uh, two different set of parameters and picking one, right? So uh, you're picking one based on the uh, like the numerator of the Bayes theorem, right? So I'm going to make use of some uh, really good visualization of this blog post to kind of intuitively explain what is happening because if you understand the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo intuition, it just feels like oh, why didn't I think of this uh, idea kind of a thing, right? Uh, so yeah, to start off, uh, Yeah, so one second, where is this one thing? Yeah, so the basic version of MCMC is Metropolis Hastings, where we are essentially at every point, we are randomly choosing another point and checking whether it's more likely or less likely than the current point. So this terrain which you see here is the posterior terrain, like posterior distribution terrain of the parameters which you uh, want to estimate. Right? It's the distribution terrain. So you, the posterior distribution uh, for a given point, you can get the numerator easily without normalization. So 
there is no guarantee that the volume under this uh, probability kind of graph is one, but the relative stuff still remains true, right? Like if a point is here uh, and a point is here, uh, then you know that this point has a lesser likelihood. So you you, uh, you have some guarantees, right? So uh, with Metropolis Hastings, all you do is kind of hop around by comparing random points around a given point uh, and check whether it's more likely or less likely. And uh, you actually have a probability measure. So you basically uh, uh, compare the two energies. When I say energy, it's essentially the numerator values. Uh, and uh, uh, you will either decide to, uh, if it has a lower energy, that is if it is more probable, you'll definitely go there. But if it has a high energy, you sometimes go there, sometimes not. So what that essentially means is exploration, exploitation of the domain. So if you are stuck in a say local minima of this uh, problematic uh, terrain, you somehow need to go, uh, get out of it, right? So to get out of it, you might immediately want to make a bad decision, that is to go into a high energy regime, but later eventually you might go to a low uh, energy regime. So that is the exploration, exploitation stuff. Exploitation is if you see a low energy particle, you go there, right? Explo uh, exploration is you sometimes also take a riskier decision of going to a higher energy place, right? So that is essentially what uh, Metropolis Hastings is. Uh, and uh, you can do a lot of optimization in how you implement it. But if you understand this intuition, you'll, f uh, you'll have an idea of when to use it, like kind of uh, if it is working or not kind of a thing, right? So if you have an idea of your posterior distribution, you'll realize whether this sort of a regime works for you or not, where you're randomly exploring and exploiting. It's generally a very simple algorithm. So it's something which you try at the first, right? It doesn't mean that uh, it will work, right? So the next kind of more advanced version of this is, uh, you oftentimes what happens is to get to another kind of a valley, from one valley, there'll be a huge mountain in between. Think of it that way. So to go from here to here, there's a huge mountain in between. You can't just go to that space that easily. So even if you sample some points around it, you'll never, it's very unlikely that you'll go to some place here. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind HMC is very simple. You take the point and think of this probability field as like a ground and you kick the ball and think of the point as a ball and you literally kick the ball in a random direction and just follow it, right? It's, it's, a, it's essentially a physics engine at this point. It is not, uh, it's nothing, uh, it's doing nothing with probability. Uh, it's just uh, uh, thinking of the probability space as a terrain and simulating a kick of a ball. And wherever it ends up as a given amount of a time, that is where your new point is or new point of consideration is. There too, you can accept, reject using uh, the Metropolis Hastings kind of a regime where you sometimes accept even if it's a bad point, but always accept if it's a good point. So the, the acceptance criteria could be similar. There are a lot of variations to it, but the way you propose a point is by kicking a ball. Uh, think of it that way. So, yeah. Uh, that's about it from a MCMC perspective, uh, intuition wise. So what is the main uh, uh, good thing about MCMC is that it has asymptotic guarantees in the sense that at limit, you're guaranteed to have a like perfect representation of the posterior, right? At limit. Uh, but the disadvantage is you can never check whether it has reached that level of convergence. So if you want to know posterior uh, with certain amount of uh, like uh, 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 with a certain amount of guarantee, you can never be sure that whether it has reached or not. There are many heuristics as such, but there's no theoretical guarantees as to that after these many points, you'll be sure about your posterior. So that is the main drawback of MCMC. And it's also that even this kicking the ball kind of a thing, might not always work, right? I'll come to why, right? There are convergence theorems, but they give very weak bounds, very, very uh, weak bounds. And 
uh, you don't want to rely on them in the sense that uh, uh, it, it's as good as in limit some of those uh, convergence theorems. Uh, practically, it's not useful. That's the thing. So the second idea of inference is particle-based inference, which is essentially you scatter a bunch of particles in the space, right? In this case, it's a 2D probability space. You scatter them and you evolve them parallelly and independently uh, using something like MCMC or HMC or whatever. So you take, you basically parallelize the whole process into like thousand points or like a million points or whatever it is. So this way, uh, you will quickly end up with uh, like more quickly end up with a place uh, with high energy because your uh, your exploration is easier here because your exploration is by your initial points itself. So you don't have to do some uh, crazy like uh, uh, throwing the ball kind of a whatever kicking the ball kind of a thing because exploration is happening through a bunch of points in the space itself. And where this is really useful is when you have multiple nodes like this, right, in your distribution. And uh, if you try to do a ball kind of a thing, there's no guarantee you'll end up kicking in this exact direction. Uh, so only if you kick in this exact direction and if you stop in time, will you actually stop in this mode? Otherwise, you'll lose the mode or you'll miss the mode. So in those kind of scattered distribution kind of scenarios, uh, Particle-based inference is the best, right? Um, but it's very expensive computationally. Uh, Particle-based inference is when you have tons of compute, parallel compute available to you. That's when you think about using particle-based inference. Um, one thing I missed about the previous thing about uh, Hamiltonian Monte, Monte Carlo is the way we actually enable this kicking the ball stuff. The way we enable it is through evolving both position and velocity, right? You kick it with some velocity and it gets, it decelerates and accelerates because of the kind of uh, terrain. So all of that requires like uh, a derivative, right? A derivative term, which is a velocity term. That means that throughout your probability density function, it should be uh, like, you should be able to get the first derivative at least. Uh, which means that the limitation is that you need a PDF or the whole model itself should be differentiable. If it's not, often case it's not. Say you take some uh, like sort of a uh, discrete scenarios. Uh, I gave you the world example where uh, it was randomly sampling between a sphere, a cube or a cuboid. That's a very discrete thing, right? That's a discrete probability distribution. In those kind of discrete cases, Hamiltonian will not work. Uh, HMC won't work. Uh, it it just doesn't have the derivative information to cross that discrete step. But there are still ways to use it in those kind of scenarios. I'll come to that. But um, yeah, yeah, this is exactly how you use HMC even in a uh, discrete scenario. It's called Gibbs sampling. Gibbs sampling is one of a one of the main features of Turing. I would say. Uh, we will uh, demo it too. So what it essentially means is you can pick and choose different inference schemes for different variables. So I, I just gave the world example where there is a discrete probability distribution when you're trying to sample between different shapes because it's a discrete, uh, like, uh, it's a very discrete thing to do, to choose uh, like uh, determinist, not deterministically, but whatever, uh, like between like four discrete options, four discrete shapes, you're choosing one. So that's a very discrete thing to do. So in those kind of scenarios, for that discreteness random variable, you can't use HMC. But the rest are still continuous. For example, the radius of the sphere is a still a continuous variable. And even the length of the cube is also uh, uh, continuous. So you can choose to use HMC in all those kinds of continuous variables by literally specifying which of them. And you can, uh, for the rest, you can use something else. You can use MCMC, for example. MCMC is, uh, doesn't, uh, like the regular Monte, uh, sorry, Mark, uh, what do you call it? Markov chain. No, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, sorry, Metropolis Hastings. The regular Metropolis Hastings uh, doesn't require any uh, derivative information and will work even in super discrete scenarios. 
So you can mix and match between inference schemes. So the fourth option is variational inference, where it's a, it's the most kind of uh, uh, it's what a deep learning guy would try to do if he enters probabilistic programming regime, right? I'll tell you why. What is a deep learning person comfortable with? Optimization, right? They want to optimize. They want to use Adam or some other sort of a uh, optimization scheme and take a loss function and just like go reach the minima as well as possible. Try to reach the global minima, right? So what they do with variational inference is they turn this entire problem of finding a distribution and inference into an optimization problem. How? So what we essentially do, I don't know why it's the thing is not working. So yeah, so assume that this green color thing is the posterior you want to fit, right? So what you do is essentially you'll find an approximating distribution, a parameterizable op op approximation distribution, which has the ability to sort of closely fit the posterior given some random parameterization and you optimize for those parameters. You don't infer, you don't do any probabilistic inference, you do literal uh, uh, optimization. You fit between distributions, that is you try to get them to resemble each other, right? So how do you do it? You literally have something like a loss function to compare between distributions. It could be some sort of a divergence measure like KL divergence uh, or uh, uh, or it could be something like evidence lower bound, which is again a degree of similarity between distributions. It's 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 a it's not a metric. It's a uh, it's a divergence uh, kind of a figure, right? Uh, it doesn't follow the real analysis metric kind of rules, but that's okay. So uh, we don't want that kind of guarantees. We only want uh, relative guarantees, not absolute guarantees, which a full metric provides. And that's what it does, essentially, take the approximating distribution and fit it. And yeah, uh, we can also do map and maximum likelihood uh, estimations. Here, uh, we don't care about the distribution. Say, uh, I, I went to XKDR's uh, package, which is CR Rao, and sometimes uh, there, there might be scenarios where you don't really care about the entire distribution, posterior distribution, and you only want the one estimate. Often it happens with linear regression too, right? But you still want the kind of composability and kind of explainability power of Turing, for example then you can still get the map estimate, which is essentially an optimization problem uh, and uh, get the maximum of posterior. That is the, the, the kind of uh, the point, the parameter point in the posterior space, which is maximizing the numerator of the Bayesian, uh, the Bayesian equation, Bayes equation, right? So that is what you can still get. Uh, MLE is just taking the likelihood part and uh, kind of uh, optimizing on MLE. So the difference between MAP and MLE, uh, you might be aware, but it's essentially whether you consider the prior or not, whether you consider your inherent bias or whatever, like, uh, like say expert knowledge, which is often what the prior is. Do you want to consider the expert knowledge or not? Without expert knowledge, it's essentially MLE. With expert knowledge, it's essentially MAP. Um, you can do all of that in Turing. 